Welcome to the AEW Match Guide Podcast, where we deep dive into the best matches in AEW history. Brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network and your host, Sam Brown. Hello and welcome to the AEW Match Guide Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Brown. Thank you for joining me. Every episode, alongside a special guest, I take an in-depth look at one of the best matches in AEW history. If you enjoy the show today, you can subscribe or rate it on your podcast app of choice, support the podcast financially through Red Circle, and make sure you check out all of the other great shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network, where we cover all aspects of the world of pro wrestling. We've got One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Tunnel Talk, the Trish and Sarah Wrestling Podcast, Wrestle Art with Chris Things, and Imp's WWE Adventure. You can become part of the Social Suplex community by joining our Discord, where you can chat directly to the hosts of the shows and other listeners about wrestling, sport, pop culture, and much more. And of course, don't forget to check out the Match Guide Substack, where I drop my written pieces every other fortnight. Links for all these things are in the podcast description. My guest for today is the guy who dragged me back into podcasting this year, it's the host of All Things Elite, Floyd Johnson Jr., and we're looking at FTR versus the Briscoes from ROH Supercard of Honor in 2022. How are you going today, Floyd? I'll, uh, I'm doing well, and y'all know y'all listening to the baddest tag team in podcast history. I, I heard that. <laughs> Damn right. Yes. Damn right. No <laughs> one can question my passion for <laughs> podcasting, Floyd. No one. Don't you ever dare. Don't you ever <laughs> no. dare. Um, I love four things in this world. My family. I love that's, that's my cats. Started, that's, <laughs> I love wrestling. That's where his I love my started. podcast. <laughs> yes, that's where his the daughter thing started is with the Frisco. <laughs> he hadn't done that before that. His baby girl. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, uh, dude, I'm excited. Um, like for a while until another match. This was pretty much the favorite match that I had ever seen live. I have, I was trying to, I, I went back into my tweets and my conversations with JR because me and Jay, I mean, the history of this match, it's almost like the history of my friendship. Yeah, like, we were like, hey, with JR had just started and it was because of that. And it's kind of crazy. And this was like, I believe this was the first show we ever went to together, me and JR. So uh, I am super excited. I got a lot of, good back information just random stuff about this not necessarily and you know why this is one of the unique most unique rivalries of all time it's uh it's such a good rivalry and i'm, I'm so glad to be covering it with you of all people as well floyd um and we're making history today actually for our podcast uh this is the first time we have covered a match that isn't an AEW match um so until today we've only covered AEW matches on the podcast and only reviewed them because um, this is the AEW match guide. Um, but I, I think it's only fair, um, given how much, given that Tony Khan now owns Ring of Honor and given how important Ring of Honor has become, particularly to FTR and how, how important this um, these three matches were to FTR and also how much of a presence Ring of Honor's had in AEW since the purchase by Tony Khan, I I thought it was worth extending out the remit of the AEW Match Guide podcast just a little bit uh, to cover the TK years of Ring of Honor. So, you know, we're not, we haven't included them in the Match Guide list where we've done the countdowns and things like that. I'm not a Ring of Honor historian by any, by any stretch of the imagination. So I I don't really want to claim to be, you know, you know, cataloging Ring of Honor history, but, you know, since the TK purchase has come on, I think it fits under what we do here at the podcast. So um, I, I'm very excited to get into this match in particular, this series in particular with yourself, Floyd. Um, of course, we're talking about the first match that took pay t- between the two teams, FTR and the Briscoes at Supercard of Honor in 2022. But there are other Ring of Honor matches that I think will be worth jumping into down the line as well. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm glad to have you here for yeah. this little bit of history. Yeah, I, mean, I got to tell you, uh, for the most part, it's funny. They're like, this show was fine, but it was a one-match show, right? It was the first time, for me, it was the first time I think I'd seen Willow live. Mm. So that was another good night for me. 
uh, Willow Nightingale. Um, and then, uh, but as far as the show, like literally, TK, uh, you have all the backstory story, but TK like bought it what a month before or yeah, two well, or yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll jump in there a little bit, Floyd, and I'll, I'll just kind of paint the picture. Um, because there are look, there's it's funny to think like there's people who have got into AEW. I was talking to someone on the Discord just a couple of weeks ago, um, who they got into AEW in 2023. So they've only ever known AEW with Ring of Honor. So, um, of course, Ring of Honor, you know, that's where the Young Bucks, it's where Cody came up from. Uh, sorry, Cody went to when <clears throat> most prominently after he left the WWE. It's where, you know, the the Young Bucks really came to prominence as well, you know, alongside PWG, all of that. Um, as I said, I'm not a Ring of Honor historian, but a lot of the a lot of the momentum that ring of honor had in the late 2010s was stalled when AEW uh when AEW became a company because most of their top stars left and went to AEW except for for one team in particular the briscoes who stayed there were some others of course some singles acts uh some single acts COVID was a very difficult time for Ring of Honor uh, and their parent company, Sinclair Broadcasting as well, had a lot of other debts that they ran up outside of Ring of Honor. And in late 2021, the company was put on hiatus. All of the contracts with wrestlers were torn up and it was announced that Ring of Honor would be completely restructured. Uh, And then everything kind of went dark, a lot of speculation, but in March, Um, Tony Khan came on to Dynamite uh, and he said he had a special announcement, one of his big announcements, and this time it really was a big one. Um, He stood in the ring and he announced that he had purchased Ring of Honor. Um, That Dynamite was... The dynamite was from Jacksonville, and guess who was yeah, there? Yeah, it was in Daly's place, yep. And, and they had the, the Brian Danielson versus um, Christopher Daniels match. Yes, I was literally there for the announcement. Oh, wow. How, <laughs> what did you think when he announced it, when he announced that he had purchased Ring of Honor, Floyd? Okay, I'm going to be 100% honest in here. You call me a hater or whatever. I want this to be this 100% honest. My honest reaction, hell yeah, WWE didn't get it. Yep, because <laughs> That's fair. Th- it was pretty much like, a, you know, a lot of people were throwing out there that the library was going to WWE and that, you know, in essence, because ROH owned all, all in. Right. So the rumor mm. was that WWE was going to own all in. And since, you know, like all in was this for me, life changing show, all that stuff mm. changed the history of pro wrestling. Big and part of it, AEW's history too. It is a it's AEW's pilot. I mean, mm. that's what they call it. It's AEW's pilot. It was their it was their actual visual concept of what AEW could be. So it's so important to AEW history. I even said it. I'm like, I don't like I Tony Khan's much smarter than me, much better with money, but I would buy it just to own all in. That's how important I think All In was to AEW. I would do what I can, offer what I can to make sure you owned All In. So when he got it, it was kind of like a relief, a yes. I I never like. I never thought. Let's be and I'll be very real with this. I didn't think he was going to keep running the company. I thought he just kind of bought ROH and it was going to buy their tape library. It was going to use it to sell AEW in their tape library. That's what were really my initial thoughts. But then he's like, yeah, we're still going to do shows. I was shocked. But that initial thought was, yes, WWE didn't get it because they yeah. own so much of the history of pro wrestling right now. Mm. And it had been the way that most, most tapes had been, most uh, video libraries have been going like evolve, for instance, that's, that's pretty much, all it is all owned by WWE now, uh, and I, I think it was a natural fit for for Ring of Honor and AEW to be owned by the same people. Um, it, you know, if if it does need to be owned by the same people, I'm it, in in 2024. I'm I'm really feeling uncomfortable just seeing how how the wrestling world has panned out, where it's almost it's gone from being a monopoly, which is terrible, to a duopoly, which is better, but like I would prefer that it was there was more active wrestling companies and large wrestling companies, and I don't know if the industry is big enough to sustain uh, that. But I'm yeah. not sure. Like it's more healthy than a monopoly. Don't get me wrong, but like just having two giant powers that everyone else operates under, 
I don't know, that doesn't necessarily seem super healthy to me, but it makes sense that Ring of Honor would fit in the AEW pantheon because there's so much shared DNA. Of course, you mentioned All In, like I said, the Young Bucks. But it's not just that. Like, you know, at that point, CM Punk, Brian Danielson, um, so much. The style that Ring of Honor, that Ring was really um, popularized through Ring of Honor and and through the indie boom in the twenty ten in the twenty tens, it is what came to define the style of AEW in many ways. And you know, there's other talent as well, like you know Christopher Danielson, uh, all of SCU. They came across so much of the the DNA of AEW was found in Ring of Honor. You know, like BTE, half of BTE was shot at Ring of Honor tapings. Like it, it just makes sense that it, that this tape library in particular is owned by AEW and is part of the history of AEW. Uh, and, you know, it, the rest of it can be celebrated on its own, of course, um, but particularly the parts that pertain to AEW, it would have been sad for them to be owned by the WWE. What hey, do you r- think? Remember Flip Gordon? Yeah, he was a thing. <laughs> I remember, remember Marty Skull. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, there's a few, there's a few, um, you know, oddities like that, but, uh, you know, what did you think of? Because um, we'll get to the matches, to the match, and specifically to FTR and the Briscoes. But because we are talking about Ring of Honor for the first time, I think it's worth dwelling on it and, and talking a little bit about it. You know, not necessarily going into where it is today and what it looks like today. But what did you think of the like initial integration of Ring of Honor into AEW, Floyd? Dude, um, when it happened, I was excited because I figured ROH was going to be. Uh... Oh, okay. Uh, ROH was going to be uh, AEW's NXT. I figured, uh, you know, when people were on like their down, if they were going to use them, this was always the people were on their downturn to AEW. Maybe they had just lost the title or some. Maybe they go to ROH for a few months, r- help bring titles in or whatever. I really didn't know how it was going to work <laughs> because I am I am a big fan of the. The smaller is better. Like if AEW was the way I wanted it forever, it would have been it have been four pay per views and just dynamite, right? Mm. I mean, maybe <laughs> Rampage, but four pay per views and just and just dynamite. So when ROH came, I was like, man, are they biting off more than they can chew? I mean, this was after the initial excitement of making sure WWE didn't get it. I was like, are they biting? Because he was like, oh, we're going to run shows for both. I'm like, man, are you biting off more than you can chew? That's a lot, you know? And I was hoping, like, these. this is like my early thoughts. You probably hear him on the, uh, hear him on the, uh, the pod, is that he brought in somebody specifically just to run ROH. You know, like, mm. even though it'd be under the Tony Khan universe, but bring in someone like Gabe Sapolsky, you know, from Evolve or someone under the, uh, someone of that ilk that has run successful companies. The guy that ran PWG, uh, you know, I, I was Super like, Dragon, Super Dragon, uh, the things that were going through my mind, just bring in someone and say, hey, this is your baby. This is what you do run this you know that kind of thing and uh yeah so i was i was intrigued i was intrigued so mm. i wanted to know I, like i said my big thing is i didn't want it to hurt aew yep for me i i thought it was very it was almost uncomfortable at first when particularly like jonathan Dr- gresham comes out and he's the ring of honor world champion and then you've got an aew world champion and look honestly i don't think they fully ever um properly found a balance of how do you have these two companies together but apart um and and you know having two world champions on the one the one show um with them showing up on dynamite um to promote the supercard of honor and the the other ring of honor pay-per-views i always felt very uncomfortable about that and even though i liked that ring of honor was now part of the a a ring of honor the back catalog and everything was part of AEW, and you know, in theory, that there's you've got like a clean line of all that law. It it just it felt like uh, an expansion that didn't need to happen, uh, if that makes sense. Because what you said, I, I agree with that. Like, I think one of the problems that AEW's got now is that it is too big, and unfortunately, that's just the that's the way capitalism is. Like, 
it's um these kinds of things they they're run to make lots and lots of money they cost lots of money and so they have to make lots and lots of money and part of doing that is producing lots and lots of content uh and i don't think quantity is always better uh uh, but unfortunately it's just it, it just is the the economic reality that we live in uh and i think roh was really for me the first like sign and and first rupture where i thought this is this is becoming too much there's too much stuff going on here and i yeah i kind of agree with what you're saying that like it would have been you know nice to maybe like a harder roster split but when they've tried to do that you know with like eddie kingston going off or athena going off it's then like well now we've got this great thing that's in that's kind of buried in ring of honor and ring of honor hasn't been able to catch on the same way so yeah, it's hard to say. And I, I here I am, here I am saying before you answered that we're not going to get into like the long term implications of Ring of Honor, but um, I can't help but, but yes. start going my, down. That. My whole term, is, my whole thing is this: in the world that we live in, uh, there's people like, man, you should see this guy in all Japan, right? Mm-hmm. Or you can see this guy in Big Japan or DDT or Noah. You know, I'm, you know, when it comes to Japanese wrestling, I'm mostly a New Japan guy, right? And they say, hey, you, you can watch this. And it's like, you'd be like, oh, man, this guy's talented, but he's buried on Noah. No, you say, oh, God, this guy's a talented guy that works for Noah. And you got to find a way to watch him. Mm-hmm. I feel that same way about Athena on RH. She is so talented. She is worth the effort to go find and watch. She's not buried on RH. She's on RH. You can go. You can make the effort to go watch one of the best women's wrestlers in the world. Or you yep. could not make the effort to go watch one of the best women's wrestling in the world. But I've also, yeah, I've also, like, I even said, you know, I knew AEW was going to grow, right? And I knew with mm. growth was going to come change because I am, I've worked for nothing but Fortune 500 in large companies in my life. So yep. I understand that's a part of it. So that doesn't mm. mean I wanted it, but I knew it was going to happen. And with growth, or jobs. There are people that are specifically hired that might not have ever gotten a contract or might not have a contract now, but they're specifically hired to work with ROH. I, I would a name that I'm gonna throw out there that I think has really shined between ROH and collision is ST uh STP, Shane Taylor Promotions. Yeah. Uh I don't I, I think Shane Taylor was go- kind of gone and he was kind of an extra, you know, and then it's like you have this whole other show. You know, you got collision and you got this. And you're like, oh, you know, we need people to wrestle. Mm. And it's like, and he, you know, he's kind of come as a phoenix. And now he has fans. And like when he loses, people are like, dude, when is STP going to start winning? Because Shane mm. Taylor with the TV time won a lot of people over, you know. Mm. And I, I think he's like done a lot for Lee Moriarty, who I think a lot of people thought was just the guy. And then. Shane, you know, because of Shane Taylor promotion, the amount of matches they had, the amount of good matches they were having, you know, people mm-hmm. are like, oh, why aren't they not, you know, why aren't they not winning? So I do think it opened up opportunities for people because, in essence, ROH is, you know, you can still watch ROH, you know, mm-hmm. it's still very accessible. And then they have collision too. So it's like, it's a lot. But I talk about on our pod every time, if you listen, there's too much wrestling now, right? Mm-hmm. I like other things. You have kids. Uh, you know, I, I like other <laughs> things. So, you know, I like, oh, I want to watch I want to watch uh, a comedy tonight. You know, I want to watch Star Trek, the new Star Trek series. Well, what wrestling am I going to skip to watch it? Because literally wrestling's on every day. Yes, it's true. <laughs> and and look, you're right to wrap me across the knuckles a bit there, Floyd. I think um, what you said before. <laughs> uh, l- let's uh, let's move on on from our talk around Ring of Honor. Um, there'll be a time to continue the discussion, I think. And you know, as I said, I don't think I, I envisage that we will probably potentially cover more Ring of Honor matches, even if look, even if we only cover ladder matches in this series of matches i i, I think it'd be worth it uh so let, let let's move on um you and i we've talked about and, and start focusing on the the teams and and this match of course this uh match was scheduled for supercard of honor which was already scheduled to take place when tony khan bought ring of honor uh and he honored that commitment running a show on wrestlemania weekend it's the first time tony khan had run a show on wrestlemania weekend uh, and 
you know, it was between these two teams that had sort of been squaring off against each other online for quite a while, FTR and the Briscoes. Now, Floyd, you and I, we've talked about FTR before. Um, they're your favorite tag team of all time. We spoke about their match with the Young Bucks. That's the first time that I had you on. So if people want to hear, you know, the ins and outs of you talking about FTR uh, and and how you came to enjoy them and, and got to know them and, you know, heard them cut promo on the Young Bucks personally. Um, they could go back to that episode. It's uh, one of the earliest episodes I did of this show. Uh, but tell me, what was your history with and knowledge of the Briscoes before Dax and Cash started jawjacking with them through Twitter? So this is this is always hilarious because uh, pretty much every uh, – since I got into the hardcore – I like the IWC, and people always say, any time you're on the internet, you're in the IWC, that is not true. There is a whole different level to the wrestling IWC. Because I used to get on Twitter and Facebook and all the stuff and post my wrestling thoughts, but that doesn't mean you're in the IWC. I'm with Social Suplex, and then I started listening to Voices of the Wrestling. I, well, that was my graduation to the IWC. And I tell them the reason I say that. He's like, oh, why is he saying that? Well, I was at one of the all-time historical wrestling shows ever, and I don't even—I barely remember being there. I know I was there, but I couldn't tell you really anything that happened. But I did see the Briscoes on the show the night before WrestleMania 20 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. ROH did us basically—I think it was the precursor to Supercard of Honor. And they had a lot of matches, and AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, the Briscoes, everyone. Damn. It was, this was like, but no, like. Think of, uh, like so this is WrestleMania 20. So we're talking 20 years ago. None of yep. these people were anything. 2004. You know? were, yeah, they were indie gods. You know what I mean? None of these people were anything. So uh, I was there and I saw the Briscoes and I didn't think anything of them. And uh, that was the first time I saw the Briscoes. And then uh, I kept hearing about this tag team because a lot of times I tell people, I was a WWE guy. I watched all WWE programs. I knew everything about WWE. I didn't go out to the indies and stuff. It just it wasn't super accessible. And I just didn't feel like putting in the effort. Well, I started hearing about this tag team and uh, that WWE was going to sign called the Briscoe Brothers, and they were in Ring of Honor. And I saw a Ring of Honor show in Oklahoma City. Jay Briscoe was the world champion. I believe, and I heard they were, you know, dim boys, and that was like, I think that was the first time I saw, I the first time I saw them, I saw Briscoe as a singles wrestler, not them as a tag team, and I remember them chanting, dim boys, dim boys, you know, that kind of thing, and um, I forgot what it, man up, it was man up, not them boys, this was pre-dim boys, it was man up, what was, the, was what everybody was chanting, and they put on a really good show for with uh, War Machine, uh, the, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, one of the wrestlers, the bigger one, was just called War Machine, even though the tag team was called War Machine. It was weird. Um, and they wrestled in the main event, and I thought he was really good. And then er, I, I started seeking them out. Like, I saw a lot of their matches with the Young Bucks and all that stuff, and I always thought they were excess, uh, er, er, very, uh, very good wrestlers. But I literally thought they were indie gods. I never thought they would sign with a major company ever because uh, I had heard about the Mark Briscoe uh, thing. The the reason he wasn't on TBS and TNT with the racist comments or whatever. And I mean, that was Jay Briscoe, not Mark. I want to yep. make sure it's Jay Briscoe, not Mark. And they weren't going to ever be on TV or whatever. But, uh, you know, I'd seen them wrestle and I was like, oh, it sucks. They're going to be those guys that are going to be the greatest independent or greatest, yeah, independent tag team or the greatest tag team that never made it, you know, that kind of thing. So, mm. I mean, and if anybody gets mad at me, I'm telling you, this was my thoughts then. This is, he, Sam asked me my thoughts then, you know, like I wasn't familiar with them. They weren't the baddest tag team on the planet to me. They were a really good ROH tag team. And so I saw some ladder matches. I saw some, matches with the kingdom and all that kind of stuff. And I became a fan to the mm. point where it was like, it was like, I, I wouldn't even, say, you know, like I wasn't a hardcore fan. I wasn't watching every Briscoe match I could watch, but if I knew they were on a show, I would make sure I was going to be there. 
Hence, mm. this weekend that we were going to see the show, they were supposed to, they had been working with Impact, right? And there mm. was a, a New Japan Impact dual show. We, Me and JR bought our tickets to see the Briscoes. So this was before the match was announced. So that's up until this point before the match was announced that's where i was with the briscoes yeah look i'm i'm glad you're honest because look I, honestly i knew even less <laughs> i wasn't before uh, AEW. i wasn't really i didn't really follow ring of honor beyond following the bt the guys from bta beyond following the elite so i was mostly the young bucks and i kind of saw the briscoes through the prism of the young bucks and you know occasionally they showed up in new japan of course i knew of their reputation as just like these wild men but i just did not see a lot of them because you know as we kind of talked about like you can only watch so much wrestling and they just weren't part of the promotions and the matches that i was seeking out and that i was watching and digging deep into uh so you know like they were kind of this tag team that i knew existed i knew was great i saw the odd match of you know like the look of them but i wasn't you know seeking them out specifically for that uh and you know, like this series of matches is really the first series of matches where I really, uh, like in my own mind, put a spotlight on them to be like, let's let's see how the great how great the Briscoes are, and and boy, like my mind was opened, uh, and and you know that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited to talk about this match uh, and this series is because like this is a these are a couple of guys that you know once you start watching and digging into their promos and digging into their matches like you just see like this incredible team uh with this incredible aura around them uh and this incredible presence and this incredible portrayal of these characters that they've they've made which have you know very much an extension of themselves very much the old stone cold it feels like the old stone cold turned up to 11 sort of trick uh and yeah th- and this is where i really got to know them in this in this feud uh dude and this i mean i you know when watching the video that you sent i was like man this this might be sam's favorite tag team because you like just the real guy tag teams you know like just you know the real guy people those are your favorite type of characters like john moxley and i was like this is like the tag team version of john moxley and that and yeah. that's just because that was like my best you know best comparison because the briscoes as we'll find out as we keep talking, are unique. They are very much one-on-one. They do not wrestle like anyone. You're not really. I mean, they take a couple moves every now and then, but they don't wrestle like anyone. It is very much like a fight when they're out there. Yeah, like my favorite wrestlers uh, are wrestlers that have got a bit of grit to them. And like, you know, John Moxley, obviously, um, Eddie Kingston, Hang- Hangman Page, he's got a bit of grit to him as well. Uh, and these guys, they fit right in. So let's get into the build up to this a little bit, uh, this match a little bit. Uh, of course, these, th- this sort of all, all started with, uh, a bit of a Twitter back and forth really, um, between Dax Harwood and, um, the Briscoes. And then the Briscoes started shooting these videos, uh, and, and after Dax Harwood was, um, calling them out, and this is prior to Final Battle in 2021. So it's been announced, sort of, that Ring of Honor is after Final Battle will be going on hiatus. You know, so there's a bit being made of that, but of course, like the Briscoes, they're probably looking around, going, you know, how can we, how can we stay in the limelight? What can we do to stay relevant? Uh, you know, wh- what are we going to be doing after Ring of Honor? Because they've been such Ring of Honor loyalists forever. Uh, you know, like they were the they were one of the great the people that stayed with Ring of Honor when AEW happened. There was various reasons for that, of course. You kind of mentioned with Jay Briscoe, uh, but as well, like when Jay Briscoe passed, there was so many stories about how he would go into negotiations with Ring of Honor, and he was just so loyal to them that he'd say he'd open up negotiations by saying, I- "I'll stay with him. you. Know I'm going to stay with you now. Let's negotiate." Uh, <laughs> you know exactly the exactly the wrong way that you're meant to negotiate. Um, but you know, so when Ring of Honor's winding down, you know they must have seen FTR as like, okay, this is a challenge, and I think FTR as well, like end of 2021. I don't know. I think it's fair to say they weren't exactly riding high, like after the Young Bucks beat them. And I think 
it was the right decision for the Young Bucks to beat them in 2021, uh, you know, particularly given how well the Young Bucks did uh, in their reign. But I think FTR were pushed to the back a little bit, and I don't think they knew how to handle it. They they sort of had a feud with Proud and Powerful that was, you know, didn't exactly hit in the way that we thought it would. And I think they were really trying to find find themselves a little bit. Do you think that's fair to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. The pinnacle had ran its course. You know what I mean? And uh, they were kind of like in this no man's land of they weren't in the tag team title race. They weren't doing a lot. You know what Mm. I mean? But, you know, uh, the Briscoe stuff, promo stuff on Twitter you know, going at each other, man, that, that's why it's like, because the Briscoes didn't have national TV time, I said this was like the most unique rivalry ever, because it was completely built on Twitter, mm. completely built on Twitter, no, no TV, like even, even uh, up to the event, yep. AEW didn't announce it on their, te- talk about it on their television yep. show, like, this was completely built on Twitter, completely self-promotion between FTR and the Briscoes, building to a match that they didn't know if they were ever going to have, you know, yep. because you didn't know if, you know, the Briscoe status, you knew FTR was with AEW, were they going to be able to find the time to wrestle each other? So they're cutting these promos. I am, I am loving it all. I, you know, as far as I love FTR. Love, you know, loved the Dax and Cash promos. I love them. But these were their best stuff because Mm. it was just them talking. You know what I mean? And it was just like Dax had these moments where, you know, he would go into like like, promo guy. I was like, no, just talk like you're going to fight. You know, I was Mm. like, yeah, it's like like, it was just like, like those moments. And then the Briscoes, the most unique promo like like of wrestling history. A lot of times, if you notice, Mark's cutting a promo and Jay's cutting a promo. They're both about the people that they're wrestling, but they're definitely not going to have the yep. same path. Yep. <laughs> so Mark was, one time Jay was pissed off and Mark was kind of like, y'all surprised me. <laughs> I was, yep. I was like, it was like, it was a complete clash in their feelings. And I, I love that because like I said, there's nothing like it. That's the one but, thing I that say about the Briscoes. They're one of one when it comes to pro. Yeah, yeah. They're they're always like in their barns or on the back of a ute, something in their shed, something at their farm, their farm. Sorry, their chicken farm, and and they've got such a unique dynamic. Like Jay gets super intense. You know, he's like swearing and stuff, and and Mark gets intense in his own way as well. But he's a little, he's much more laid back and and kind of. Not quietly spoken, but softly spoken. But you know, he, he's much more. His demeanor is not as intense as Jay, uh, and but he's always like eating like some sort of weird food, or you know, like some yogurt or some chips or something while this is happening, or drinking a drink. Uh, Ooh, you know, uh, the like, got their it. own little their own little demeanor there, and it's so it's so like it, it's very it's so unique, but you believe them. That's the thing that, that, it, that comes off. It's so the authenticity is just like, so, uh, well, it, it is authentic. It is completely them. Um, and particularly when Jay gets intense, like you look into his eyes and you can tell there's no lie there. Like he, he really means every, it seems like he means every single word that he's saying. Uh, and, and, you know, like, in these promos, you know, like the Briscoes, they're cutting promos that are saying that, you know, FTR are ducking them, that they're hiding behind Tony Khan, that FTR are being protected by the suits um, because, like, they don't know what they're doing playing with the Briscoes. And there's, like, a great line from Mark which just sort of sums up their whole, like, their whole line of um, what they're saying about FTR. They're saying, he, he says, you're like babies running around with a knife. You don't even realize the danger that you're in. Like you're playing a game. You think you're playing a game. You don't realize the danger that you're in. Uh, and uh, there's like that. That's sort of their line of um, their line of attack at FTR. And it's like a really effective line because, of course, we know now that Warner 
that they'd actually tried to get the Briscoes into AEW, but Warner had said no due to Jay Briscoe's previous homophobic comments that he'd made. You know, of course, we I don't want to like re legislate it all, but I just need to make sure it's very clear that, you know, he went, he, he apologized for those and people that knew him well who, who were gay have said that he like really went through his own like education process. And he's actually, you know, I kind of feel like he's a bit of an example of what you know, like what, what people should be like, you know, if yeah. they've said something that's out of sorts, uh, but how they can, you know, apologize and, and learn from it. Um, but, you know, like we knew that that was never going to happen. So them saying like that FTR getting protected by the suits, it's just like such an effective form of attack because here's these guys that are like these wild chicken farmers who are never going to be let on TV. It's, it's so believable that like, yeah, the suits are protecting this this team that is on the multi million dollar contract uh, that is you know on the the TV show that's watched by a million people every week that's you know in the lights and in the and has the glamour they're being protected from us from us wild men who are and like they're trying to call us out but they don't even know how much danger they're in if they get in a fight because they've never been in a fight with guys like us dude and that that was the overwhelming theme is like FTR is like we're bad. We're, we're, we're bad. And it's like, like, yeah, you've been bad under these condition lights, you know, with your catering and your, you know, shuttles to the airport. You've been, you've been babied, you know, mm. they, they grew, they, they groomed you. They got you. I didn't want to use the word groomed because, you know, different meaning now, but they've raised you up from NXT when you was babies mm. and they took yep. care of you. And you, the only way you existed the only way you were great is because you were in this controlled environment where they decided you were going to be great. I mean, that was basically the promo, but it's like done in Mark and Jay's way. Cause I will mm. tell you, you I tell you the no teeth, the accent, the chicken farmer from Delaware. I had Mark Briscoe on an intelligence level. And then you hear that man talk and it's like, you don't just hear what he says. Mm. You, you listen to what he's saying, and he says these very intelligent things, but it's coming from a voice you don't expect intelligent things to come from. And yep. that's what you're talking about, the baby with the knife. It's very much like, you know, like a, a farmer thing, but dude is like, oh, shit. Yeah, that really does make sense, you know? Mm. And he would throw out these, like, you know, Jay is coming directly at very he like, I want to fight you. I want to mess you up. Especially at blah, blah, blah. Yeah, especially at Doc. Apparently, Jay Briscoe has a problem with bald headed people. I think we need, really, really need to uh, focus on that part of it. Because <laughs> he called him a bald headed bitch more times than I can count. Oh, so uh, yeah. it's pretty hilarious when Mark's like, hey, ease up on the hair thing, mate. <laughs> yeah, because he ain't got no hair. So I was like, yeah, dude, go, what's going on? No, no, it's, uh, yeah, he called him that so many times. He's like, and his beautiful dreads, but it was just such a, it was such a different because it was so raw. It was so mm. raw. It felt like an indie tag team program. You know what I mean? Mm. And it was like I'll say it again. I remember uh, replying. I looked up a tweet where I replied to Dax, uh, and he had said Briscoes, and I was like, just two two weeks notice anywhere in the world, and I'll be there. And that's how I felt. I that's how yep. I felt. Like from that promo, two weeks and uh, in two weeks notice anywhere in the world, and I'll be there. And it it was crazy how good it was. It was just like I feel like, like especially with our uh, with the lack of TV time that some people can get in uh, AEW at times and ROH, you know, in a, and in a sanctioned way, there should be more feuds built like this. No, don't try to copy it, of course. But there should be more feuds built on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and look, we've just waxed lyrics about the Briscoes. And they were, to be fair, they were putting out the most videos. Uh, they had no as, choice. They had no choice, <laughs> exactly. Um, but FTR, they also like had a really good line of, que like, line of attack at the Briscoes, saying that the Briscoes have always been comfortable being big, fe big fish in, in a small pond, essentially. Like, they've good. never... They've never gone out beyond, you know, what they're comfortable doing. And that's a, like, that is a, a really sharp line of attack from a team like FTR. Uh, and, like, 
I, I found particularly the video promo that they did. And, and look, there's a there's a YouTube video out there that's got all these promos on it. I'll, I'll put it in the bio. It's worth watching because um, they, they're so good. And, and I thought, like, FTR's promo was so good. They cut, like, this promo where they, like, say that they'll fly down there. Um, you know, they can make a field of dreams ring in the cornfield or, and have the chickens sit around and be their, be their, uh, their, their audience for it. And, and I, I learned so much about the like, chicken farm that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In response, yeah. Yeah, and particularly, like, I, I thought Cash was brilliant in his promo um, where he was he was the one that was outlining all of that. And he normally doesn't get uh, as much praise as as Dax Harwood does for, for, like, his fiery promos. But I thought that was really good. And I think, like, FTR as heel promos are so good. This made me miss some big heels watching this. And, of course, Dax, Dax cut that promo that he's now, like – Sadly, it's kind of become a bit of a meme, but it was the first time he'd done it, and it uh, it was very effective. And and like this is, in many ways, like they start this, and we're going to see this in the match as well. Like they start this feud as heels um, because they're big leaguing the Briscoes, but and it's a battle for authenticity. Like they're both saying, like you guys aren't real. We're realer than you. Um, we're tougher than you. We're harder than you. And, and FTR are the heels because they're, like, the more famous, the more well-known. They're punching down. Briscoes are punching up. But, like, we're going we're going to see in this feud that – and in this match that this is where FTR turn themselves face. And, and part of it as well, I think, is just because, like, Dax is talking about his love for this and how, you know, like, Jay Briscoe, you're questioning my authenticity, questioning my cred- credentials – like I have grinded, I have fought, I have scrapped, and I will fight you just as hard as you fight me. And that's like a fair point to make in this situation, given what is being said to him. Yeah, I was like, uh, I remember it was like this point. They called him by his indie name, Casey McKnight, and he's like, "Yeah, I was Casey McKnight. You know, I was rolling down, you know, d- up and down these indies pass. And while I was doing that, I was going to school. I was working three jobs." So I could get an education, you know, uh, both cash index have college degrees. They're like, dude, they're basically there's more than one way to grind. That's what they were saying. It was like mm-hmm. they, they they weren't trying to knock the Briscoe's hustle, but he was like, there's more than one way to grind. And you might not have saw my grind in ROH, but that didn't mean I was grinding any less. You know, that that's what I'm like. It was like, you know, look at us. We're not who WWE pushes, you know. Mm. We're not who we're not the guys that we're not on the top of Vince's dream team, and we still made it. We're still mm. here. How bad do we got to be to have made it through that? You know that kind of thing. And mm. it's just like it was like the contrast in it. It's like they're both, you know, uh, FTR is from small towns in North Carolina. Briscoes are from a small town in Delaware, or it, 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 a very small region of the country up there. So mm. they, they're from small towns. So they're like, we're both from small towns. We both had the scratch and claw. But because the FTR came from the WWE, they were looked at as you know highfalutin. So that's mm. how that was the that was the Briscoe side of it. So I just, dude, it was so good. It, it, like I said, one of one feud. It's like mm. you really can't compare this to anything because in history of wrestling, because of movement and stuff, how often do you have one tag team that's been around for 20 years, one tag team that established themselves for 10 years, and they had never touched? Mm. How often does that happen? Yeah, and, you know, you got a glimpse of the intensity and the potential chemistry F- when FTR showed up at Final Battle, um, but there's, like, very limited exchange there. It's more just like a stare down uh, and then they continue. And then of course, right before ROH uh, super card of honor is going to be announced. This match for the ring of honor tag team championships is put in place. Uh, and you, obviously you, you lived up to your promise. Didn't you Floyd? You, you went there, dude. We You're, had... Were you already at, were you already going to mania that weekend? I, or I, 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 about? So in my plans, I was not going to mania. But a lot of things changed in a very short amount of time. Uh, around late January, this this guy you might have heard of him called Cody Rhodes. Uh, yeah, he I remember. Left. I remember that guy. <laughs> he, he left AEW. Whatever happened to him? <laughs> uh, he left AEW 
And the moment he left AEW, they basically said, we're not going to tell you where he's going to go. We'll let you know where we're at. I bought a ticket to WrestleMania 38 because I knew if Cody was leaving AEW, he was going back to WWE. So me and JR, just friends, started planning our whole WrestleMania trip around because we found out uh, Cody was going to be there, right? So, uh, you know, I think, yeah, so I wasn't going to WrestleMania. I was actually going in the weekend because there's WrestleCon, all that stuff, and there was going to be a lot of AEW mm-hmm. people in there, and I was definitely, and it was in Dallas, which is only three and a half hour drive away from me. I, I know some people three and a half hours may seem like a long drive. When you live in this part of the country, everything's far away. So <laughs> three and a half hours, to me, I say it's around the corner. I don't even think about it. So um, that being said, so we decided we were going to go to WrestleMania. And then I was like, oh, I'm actually going to the show. I'm like, so we started getting our tickets to the show. So uh, I'm, I'm originally going to Dallas. And there's going to be no FTR, no Cody, as far as I knew, you know. And then by the show, it looks like Cody signed, you know, Cody signs with WWE. In my heart, that's what I believed, even though it wasn't announced. And then I'm at Revolution, you know, when Tony, uh, it was it Revolution? Yeah. I'm at no, Re- was it uh, on Dynamite when he announced it? Yeah, it was Dynamite, though. Yep. Actually, the Friday before Revolution. It was a yeah, I, I can't remember to be honest. I, I don't no, have it noted down. The only reason I, was, I remember it like, was the, the only the only reason I remember because I was there. You know, I was with Tiffany in the front row. <laughs> That's the only reason I remember. So I was like, yeah. So, uh, um, you know, I, we were there and they announced it, and then it was like, oh, and then I was like, it's FTR and Briscoe's happening, and it happened. We sold tickets to another show to go to this show. As far as we were considered, because I remember JR was like, but it's just one match. And I was like, for me, it's the match. You know, I was like, screw the whole weekend. If I was only going to go see one thing in Dallas that weekend, it was going to be FTR versus the Briscoes. And it was a good decision, I think, as we're going to get into. Uh, So let's get into the match. Let's start off by giving its flowers. Of course, Dave Meltzer gave this one five stars when he rated it for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. And currently on Cage Match, it is rated 9.58. So this is a match that's held in very high regard. Of course, we didn't include Ring of Honor matches in the AW Match Guide list. Uh, I, I probably won't do that ever, but if, if we you know revisit the list down the line, uh, the countdown of the greatest matches AEW's had, uh, just because I think it it does muddy the water too much, but uh, we we will in, we'll we'll continue to include Ring of Honor on the podcast here. Why are so many dogs suffering from health issues? Actress Katherine Heigl, who's helped save over sixteen thousand dogs through her foundation, says she's seeing more issues with dogs' joints, odors, and health than ever before. And after doing a ton of research. She feels there's one place we can look to support any dog's health. Their food. So she decided to create something she could actually feel good about feeding her dogs. It's called Superfood Complete. Superfood Complete is made with over 30 of the healthiest ingredients on the planet, including several superfoods vital to your dog's health. Badlands Ranch also sponsors the Jason Debus Heigl Foundation which has helped rescue thousands of dogs and place them in loving homes. Dogs across America are trying this food and experiencing amazing health benefits. Go to BadlandsRanch.com slash save50 and order right now to get up to 50% off your regular price order with a 90-day money-back guarantee. If you want your dog to experience all these incredible things, go to B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S Ranch dot com slash save 50 today this is an ad by BetterHelp. what are your self-care non-negotiables it's hard to make time for the things that keep you healthy but being consistent with self-care is like working a muscle and when life gets crazy that muscle keeps you strong therapy is the ultimate self-care and better help makes it easy to get started with affordable online sessions you can do from anywhere 
Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com today to get 10% off your first month. I love this Ring of Honor setup. When they when they showed it, I remembered immediately that I, I really like this setup. I love how it gives it a different feel um, from, from the rest of AEW. I especially love like the tight entrance ramp uh, and, and stares at the ramp. It just feels like the crowd is in on the people it gives like a real intimate feel and i think i think even like the sides are actually wider um you you've probably you've been to more more uh aw and ring of honor shows than i have for sure floyd so you'll be able to correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like the sides are wider but just that that setup with the ramp with the ramp and the ring of honor um tv up the front um big screen on the front feels so intimate i i love this setup for ring of honor i i wish that it had continued with this setup Yes, and this was at a place I'd already seen wrestling a lot of times, Curtis Colwell Center in uh, Arlington. That's where they had done Winter is Coming. Uh, so, it, you know, when you walk in, even the AEW setup versus the ROH setup, the ROH setup did feel more intimate. It felt like they were expecting somewhat of a smaller crowd. So they were like, oh, we're going to tighten. We're going to focus on the people who are here, you know, and not focus mm. on the people that aren't here. So I thought that was really good. And I, I've always liked the uh, ROH setup, you know, when I've, the few shows I went to. So I really did think this was a really cool way to do it. Uh, I couldn't get lower. I couldn't get lower level seats, which was, yeah, that's how hot this ticket got after FTR and Briscoe's got announced. Mm. It, it yeah, it, a, when I say this, if before they announced it, you could get on the floor in the second or third row. I remember telling JR, because like I said, I went back and looked at comments. You could get like in the first five row for like $65. People were basically giving away their tickets. After FTR and the Briscoes, they went up to like three or $400 to sit in the uh, first few rows. Yeah. I mean, you, and you could tell the effectiveness. That just speaks to the effectiveness of the build that they did. Uh, and, and you can also see the effectiveness of the build when, you know, both teams come in, you know, both have got great entrances uh, and a, like real heated face off with holy shit chance beforehand before anyone locks up. And you can see both teams are like sort of taking it in. There's no handshake to start like these two teams are not on like they're on a they've got, there's a lot of animosity between them. They're not on the same um, play like they're there for a fight, as they've been saying. And there's there's animosity, there's rivalry, there's hatred. And the crowd's just like going mental before anyone even locks up. This uh, and been then, the main event of the show. I just want to throw that out there. As a person going to the show, this should have yep. been the main event. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it's a good it's a tradition of yeah. AEW uh and Ring of Honor now that uh they have these really hot tag matches like third third yeah. from the top and then the, the crowd gets a bit worn out. I, I felt and, so bad. I felt so bad because I I'm telling you, I'm like I'm there with JR and the match ended and like, oh, we're done. We literally thought about <laughs> leaving and making the end of the TNA New Japan show because like nothing else on that show really was interesting. Like we cared about, so it was like. But well, was like, this is before they really started piling yeah. in the AW. No, no like names listen, as well. Like the yeah. the main event was Gresham versus Bandito. Yeah, it was like six, it was like six weeks. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't a lot of time to make a card. So they they basically mm-hmm. made a one match card and they put the one match in the middle yeah. of the show. There were people that left, and that's why I didn't leave. I saw so many people up top leaving. I was like, well, I don't want this. I don't want it to look empty. So I look at, oh, okay, we'll stay. And we stayed yeah. for the show. It was very happy because very exciting. Yep. It, it was the debut of Samoa Joe at the end of the show because we're not covering the whole show. So we were very happy for that. So mm. and we were glad we stayed because it was it ended up being an altogether good show. But yep. you know, for the most part for us, it was a one-match show. Mm. Um, Cash and Mark, they start off, uh, and the crowd really wants Jay and Dax because they've been like Jay's been calling Dax a bald headed bitch, and yeah, Dax has been pissed off at Jay. Like they've been the main antagonists, um, and it sort of establishes the inter team rivalries early on that we'll sort of see where like a lot of the time it's Jay and Dax squaring off and Cash and Mark, and that continues through this. Uh, and yeah, it's a very different vibe between Cash. When you know, it's not that Cash and Mark are you know not getting at 
not getting into each other, but once Dax and Jay get in, it's, you know, it seems really mean spirited. Uh, and, you know, Dax even spits on Jay after their first exchange. And as I said, like I'd forgotten that because, because I remember 2022 as being like, Oh, FTR was super popular in, F- in, in 2022. Um, and I'd forgotten that they started the year as like total heels and like they are leaning very heavily into the heel stick early on in this match. Yeah. Cause you no, know, like they never turned face, right? Mm. This, this few turned them face. This match, this match turned them face because people were just like, Oh, they're really good at tag team wrestling. I'm like, oh, y'all are finally coming around. The thing I've been saying for years, <laughs> y'all are finally listening to me. Uh, like, yeah, I was kind of a dick about it. I was like, oh, so these guys that could wrestle and was doing these great things with all these great tag teams, you realize it wasn't just because the other tag team was great. You need, you know, if you're going to have a dance, you need dance partners, right? So it was like, I was like, I was I was feeling myself as far as the uh, FTR fan, me, my friend Jackie and JR were talking shit because a lot of people hadn't come around. And I knew it was because of how they were presented as heels, but it was just like they are exceptionally good. And even in this opening uh, sequence to get back to the actual match, you see I saw more in this match and it's in every match before. It's just I think it came out to me while I'm sitting in there watching it. How much more quote unquote athletic cash is is doing mm. cash because you could just saw the movement when he's moving around that snap on that arm drag uh that mm. he does on it's just like oh you like he's he, the way he moves is so much more like fluid like mm. Dax is the I always said Dax is the right hand he he'll dock you out cash is the left hand He's more of the speed, you know, the more the timing, the more the precision. And you really saw that bounce off of each other. Like, either one, you could knock somebody out with your left hand, and you could throw a jab with your right, but they have their primary power. So I looked at Cash in this match, especially in the opening part, and I was like, good Lord, he's he's so fluid. If you see that, mm. uh, the exchange with him and Briscoe, it was just so, like, you know, seamless. And they mm. hadn't wrestled before. So it was like it was immediate chemistry. That's mm. the uh, that's what I was looking for. Immediate chemistry. Uh, I'm gonna pull you up a little bit on what you said about the characters, though, and about the reason they turned face. Because I think it's very intentional. I don't think it's just people realizing they could wrestle. I think a big part of it is the issue of respect and authenticity that we're getting into this. Going into this match, like FTR and particularly Dax, they're looking down on the Briscoes. Like, and they very much look down on everyone. Like, they say, we're the top guys. We're the, te- we're, the, we're the technicians. We're the greatest tag team. And that was, like, an arrogant thing for them to say. And they treated everyone else like they were worse off, which is how they were treating the Briscoes. And that's, like, emblematic in, like, the way that Dax takes this opening exchange. Like, he spits on Jay. He then loses, like, loses control. He gets clothesline to the outside. And what does he do? He, like, loses his temper and he grabs a chair and throws it into the ring. Um, and you know, like, even though it doesn't get used, Jay grabs it and is kind of like, oh, you want to go there? You sure you want to go there? But like, he's very much l- like disrespecting, um, disrespecting the Riscos and then getting pissed off when they get the better of him. Yeah. Cause you know, as the heel, as the, the stat, you know, as the best tag team in the world, as they quote themselves, they mm. couldn't believe these chicken farmers could hang with them. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's like, you got the, what? What? You're not this good. You're yeah. not this good. We're supposed to wrap this up in three minutes. What the hell is going on? And I feel like every, in this match, like all of the strikes, all of the suplexes, they've just got like, there's just a little bit of extra popping. I don't know if it's like, it probably is the two of them like leaning into it. It's probably because it's filmed slightly more intimately. So everything feels a little bit more intense. Um, But like, Everything feels like it's got a little bit of extra pop on it, a little bit of extra intensity to it, um, which I love in this. Um, And, you know, like this match really goes up a level when they start brawling around. Um, There's like 
there's a cat there's they're like popping in and out of shot the camera's sort of like half catching some stuff it gets knocked over at one point uh and eventually they bloody up um jay briscoe under the table um and that's when ftr like finally take control and you've got jay briscoe bleeding and there's a period where like they're very much in control uh and like watching this I miss this. Like I said before, I miss, you know, how good they were as a heel promo in that lead up. And I miss this like ruthlessness streak, this streak of ruthlessness that they show when, when they've got Jay down and bloody. Yeah. Um, Hill FTR was my favorite FTR. If to, to say it that quick. So this is one of the last bastions of them being bad guys. So it was like, I was like, when we watched it, when I watched it back this morning, I was like really into it and I really did it. It was just like the, the grindiness. Uh, I use, I love the limb work. They didn't do as much. They didn't do any limb work in this match as bad, but they did do it a little bit. It was just like the cutting off the ring. It was like old school <sighs> 80s heel tag team and it was just like this is FTR at its finest to me and it was just like I I will always say this I've always preferred heel FTR like I love that they get cheered I love that they sell merch I love that their meet and greet sell out don't get me wrong but when it came to me I started loving them as the shit talking heels I still love them as faces but I, I want my shit talking heels back. And I just love that this was that last bastion of it. They were just ruthless and nasty. And, you know, they they were going to win at any cost. And that's how I prefer my wrestlers. Yeah. And, like, it's interesting because you mentioned, like, a little bit of the limb work. And I think – but I think a key to this this match is just the pace that it has. It has, like, a relentless pace. It goes for 27 minutes. And – there is very little, there are very few breaks in it where there's a few times where they like take it down a little bit or slow it up a little bit. For the most part, it is so slick and there's so like, so just for example, like after this, you, we mentioned that they're in there, they've got the hot tag. Um, sorry, they, they have Jay down. They, they give Mark a hot tag and they immediately then start trading these like really intricate sequences you know, it is kind of like a. It's funny they've been talking about how like we don't do gymnastics matches, which you know who that's like. A, you know, both of them know exactly who that's. Uh, that's like a slight against. But these guys, they're pulling off intricate sequences that would be absolutely at home in a young bucks match. Um, but there's there's a, a way that they're doing it. Um, where it's like just ever so slightly messy. So that they, um, it feels like it's all come, being come up with on the fly. Like um, when they do the redneck boogie, it's not like hit totally perfectly. Or when FTR counter um, the uh, counter into their like super superplex um, frog splash. I think they call it the powerplex combo. It like feels a bit messy because they don't hit it totally correctly. And I think there's like there's a brilliance in the art of it where, you know, they're pulling off these really well-timed and precise uh, sequences, but they feel rough, feels like it's on the fly. It feels like a fight. Yeah, when pro wrestling is best, you're still doing your five moons of doom, but you're changing them up just enough to m make it unique to the match. So they all hit their famous spots. But if you notice, even on the power plex, they, it wasn't a power, it wasn't a suplex into the splash. It was a, he did a, uh, the slingshot power bomb into the splash. Same type of effect, but it was just a little different. It was a little, it was unique for the Briscoes because you can't do, you, I felt like this was part of the story of the match. We can't do the stuff that we always do. Because we've both been watching each other for all of this time, so we know what's coming. Yeah, and and like after they have this, you know, these sequences, they start brawling again. Like, um, there's a there's a big two count when the Briscoes hit a shatter machine on um, Dude, on so FTR. I popped, I jumped out, I jumped out of my chair when they hit that shatter machine. It was so cool. Yeah, and and like they just pull immediately after there's that two count and immediately like cash pulls Mark out. There's no like space for, 
you know, them lying around after the two count, and they're just brawling, and it all sort of climaxes with, like, this giant bump that Dax and Jay take, suplexing each other off the apron, um, where, you know, and every single one of these guys is taking just giant bumps um, for this match. And Ian Riccoboni and Caprice Coleman are, like, excellent on commentary and highlighting just, like, the physical toll, the pace, the intensity of this match. They're providing so much of that emotional tone um, that, yeah. that FTR, you know, and and the Briscoes are working with. Caprice Coleman had a perfectly timed, oh, my God. I think it was on the suplex outside the ring when they landed. He goes, yes. And then he hits his note, I can't sing like him, so I'm not going to try. But he <laughs> sings, oh, my God. And it was just like, you know, it was so perfectly timed. It was yep. such that moment because it was like, when he hits the oh my god, it that generally means a shift in the match. And even though the match was already intense, the suplex to the outside actually raised it to another level of intensity. And another thing that they do so well is they help tell the story. Uh, in their obviously their commentators for ROH, they're the ROH home commentators, and so they are on the side of the Briscoes somewhat. Like, they're not being totally biased. It's not like you're listening to Bobby Heenan um, doing commentary, but, like, you can tell that they don't like the way that FTR are treating the Briscoes. Yeah. Yeah, and throughout treat- the match, yeah. that you, you hear the respect for that they have for FTR improving, which is exactly what they're wanting the audience to go. Like, they're helping take the audience on the journey towards respecting the FTR, which is the the journey that FTR want you to be on because FTR are learning to respect the Briscoes. Like it's, it's, uh, it's brilliant commentary. Absolutely. I, I, I thought they were, I thought they were, uh, right where they want to be. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I like Caprice Coleman with anyone else, but I love him with Ian Riccoboni. I just think they balance each other yep. so well. And it's like, dude, I don't want any other, you know, like group calling it uh, when it comes to ROH shows. I just think they just bring a different level of passion and love to the ROH brand that you just don't get with anybody outside of it. And yeah, I thought they did a brilliant job. I I really did want to put uh, like say how amazing they were in it because I don't know. I don't think anyone like puts them in their one or two of announcing, but I think they do ROH better than anyone else can. Yep. And the pace of the match, it it finally slows off and we get to the final stretch of things after that suplex that we mentioned that you said the oh where he does the oh my god. (laughs) He uh the the pace does slow and the focus once again is on Dax and Jay. It's where the hatred is, um, and it's where like all of this intensity is. Uh and, and Jay seems to have an advantage. But as the Briscoes go for the the doomsday device, Cash manages to halt Mark long enough um, for Dax to get off Jay's shoulders and counter. Uh, and while Mark is in the air, uh, FTR throw Jay to the outside. They line up a shatter machine, and um, Dax manages to pin Mark while Cash like just rushes to the outside and throws himself to the outside to stop Jay getting back in. Um, I'm not sure if I did that that uh, sequence justice, but it's like such a well constructed final beats the match. You know, like the two teams they're so close, and it's literally like one moment where Cash gets Mark's attention that uh, gives Dax just enough time to escape their finisher, and they've got just enough time to hit their finisher before Jay can get back in before Jay can get back into the to the ring and and break up the pin. It, <laughs> Like, these two teams, they're so close. FTR just managed to get the win, uh, and it's the perfect beat to end on, in my opinion. Dude, so this match was building to the finish. If you notice in the match, Dax and Cash hit the Doomsday device on the Briscoes. The Briscoes then hit the Big Rig, a.k.a. the Shatter Machine, on FTR. It felt like... The where they were trying to get you to go, as far as the story to match, is whoever hits their finisher first wins. You know, whoever hits yep. their own finisher first wins. So you got so many close calls. I think there was almost there was three setups for shatter machines that were end up broken up, and I think there were two setups of Doomsday Device. If I was keeping count correctly, like I said, I might I might not, but there were like three and two, and they were like 
oh, we didn't get it, right? And then it was finally FTR got it. And once one of them got their finish on, and, you know, it was over. And it was like, if you, you pay attention, if you've ever listened to how Bret Hart tells that he likes his matches or whatever, and you've ever talked about how Dax likes the psychology of his matches, it's always building to that moment. And it was just like, it was funny. It was just like, as much as he talks about how he likes his matches, this was a perfectly construed match as far as how Dax, how Dax and like storytelling. Now, I know, I think it was Dax and Jay that went over the match together or whatever, but it was, it was like how they told it. It all built to that moment. They hit their signature stuff, but the finish was the finish. And that does not happen in wrestling that much. I'm like, we live in a world where you get six hidden blades before the match is over or, (laughs) you know, six different moves. And it was like the fact that the idea was, I don't want to get hit by your finish. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, and you know, I don't want to get hit by your finish. So whoever executes it first, it's over. It's amazing, man. This was to me like perfect tag team wrestling. That I feel like this is textbook. I feel like this is like if you want to show like how you end a hot feud or you know start a hot feud or whatever, this should be the videos they're showing at uh, wrestling schools and NXT or whatever because the execution from first promo to actual match was absolutely perfect. Mm. And and in the final moment after after FTR win, uh they finally do shake hands. So, you know, they, as they I said, bow, they bow to the wrist. Exactly. Wrestle, yes, correct. First. Correct. Yes, yes, they bow first. They you know they they was like, "Oh shit. Y'all can y'all can go." <laughs> they, <laughs> they know how hard they've had to fight to win this match. Uh and the the two teams hug the crowd's giving them a standing ovation. And, you know, like, as I said, we've seen this journey of FTR and it's so well done. And then like literally the next week on dynamite, they show up and they're getting cheered. And part of the reason they're getting cheered is because after this standing ovation, who is to show up, but the young bucks, Um, the young bucks take out the Briscoes uh, and then they get chased off by FTR and they set up a match for dynamite um, to mega heat. They, they say they're not going to wrestle at Ring of Honor. They're going to mess. It. They're going to wrestle in the bright lights at Dynamite. What did you think of this being like the final angle after the match, dude? So like it's so awesome because in essence, the the thing was the Young Bucks were going heel, and yeah, uh, Young Bucks and FTR can't be on the same side. It's just it just that's just not how it works. You know what I mean? So FTR going face was logical because the young bucks were being super heel and i thought this really solidified the double turn right it solidified it because ftr won without cheating they just beat them straight up so that was huge to uh ftr shifting the faces they they didn't cheat to beat the briscoes because if you look at their history in AEW as heels they they cheated to win most of their matches so they didn't cheat to beat the Briscoes. They just won. Then they mm-hmm. showed respect, like something they don't do, bowing and hugging and loving. And then these dastardly Young Bucks, this beautiful moment has ruined by the Young Bucks, attacking yep. the Briscoes for what seems like no reason other than to say we're the greatest Ring of Honor tag team ever. And yeah, and then FTR, this was their turn. It was yep. like they came down to have the Young Bucks back, and it was just like, all right, yeah, and I gotta tell you, people cheering the, cheering FTR took some getting used to. <laughs> it did. I'm used to being the only one in the crowd, you know. Young Bucks, FTR, Young Bucks, FTR, just me screaming by myself. So it was weird. All these people, I'm like, where the hell did y'all come from? Go away. And look, mm. while while I've said, you know, at the start, I've missed them being heels. Like in this moment, it was so good for them to to go face because, like as we said, like at the end of 2022, they sorry 2021, they they really felt like for a lot of 2021 actually, they really felt like they were struggling for direction, um, you know, and they were the number two heel tag team behind the Young Bucks, whereas this, you know, then suddenly makes them the number one face tag team, and suddenly they've got a place in the in the um 
in the pecking order in AEW at the top uh, as the top face tag team. And this sets up a match between them and the Young Bucks for Dynamite, which was another fantastic match. This was when FTR were just on an absolute hot streak. Uh, So, yeah, I agree with you totally with with what you've said there. It was a a great piece of setting things up. And, you know, I only wish that, you know, maybe we could have got the Briscoes and the Young Bucks as well at some point uh, down the line. And uh, we we could have got that on Dynamite as well. But alas, it wasn't to be. Uh, I can honestly say, like, one of my, like, regrets after, unfortunately, he passed is that, you know, us as fans didn't do more to get him on TV. And it was like, you know, you see all those give people a chance and all these different hashtags of Twitter that taken off and, you know, got, you know, got corporations to change their mind. And it was like, I wish we could have done more for Jay. But the problem was, you know, I kind of, you know, I understood the other side because you can't tell the other side how to feel. You know what I mean? So, Mm. uh, you know, I understood the non-forgiving side. You know, it it is what it is. But uh, Mm. so it was just one of those situations. But I because I do think and you're seeing now with the rise in popularity of Mark just cutting his promos. Just imagine if we were getting those Briscoe type promos Mm. on national TV and Dynamite, how big they're i mean they have a nice fan base but how big it would have grown because it is this unique raw them Mm. style that you can't compare to anything else anybody else doing what they do sounds like they're playing a character at Mm. no point do the briscoes ever sound like they're playing a character Mm. absolutely absolutely before we get to the legacy of the match and we'll we'll go more into to what you were just talking about there floyd uh, I just wanted to to say this match is it's fantastic. I remember talking to Rich about the um, Young Bucks versus Hangman and Omega match, uh, and we briefly talked about that as well on the the countdown of the top AEW matches list. Uh, and I've always said that that is like the template for what the elite want from wrestling. Um, like it's you know a mixture of this great athleticism and character driven story, and I feel like this match is really this is like the template for what FTR would say great tag team wrestling is and they're not too dissimilar like it's great it's great athleticism and it's a great story of like this story of respect and authenticity that these two teams are telling uh and for so so often I've like said you know FTR and the Young Bucks they're almost like two sides of the same coin but this match is is very much this is like the magnum opus of FTR uh it's got incredible athleticism like there's so much intensity to it, which I think is something that uh, particularly Dax and Cash, like they they love to have that like that authentic fight feel, uh, and of course like you know the the back and forth nature of it, and then the story, as we said, like the the character progression of them, um, where it's about you know them through through this fight realizing how good the Briscoes are and and developing respect through that. You know how much pressure had to be on these four men? They were cutting all time like cell phone promos or whatever and posting them on Twitter. Just think if this match was just okay. You know what I mean? It was like, dude, you wasted that build. So you had to be bring a match that matched the build. And I think they like they nailed it. You know what I mean? Mm. They nailed it because you don't. You honestly don't want it to be too heated because it's a first match, right? Like, you don't, you can't bring that dog collar match energy because the dog collar match was, you know, basically, you know, the culmination of a feud. This was their first match. And I just, man, the tone of the first match, the tone of the promos, the tone of everything came through in this match and they told a perfect story. It was just like, I, I even said, I always said, um, when we were doing the match guide, I couldn't put this match on there. And I was like, <laughs> it's one of the best matches I've ever seen live. It's probably the best pure tag team match I've ever seen live. And my de- pure tag, tag team matches, no chairs, no stipulations, just a pure tag team match. It was probably the best tag team match I've ever seen live. Yeah, you did ask me more than once if you could yes. vote for this. <laughs> yes, because it was just like, it was so funny because FTR's best matches, like, since they, 
left WWE. Like their their matches where you're gonna say these are the top on your resume didn't happen in AEW. That is the craziest part of this is that they didn't happen in AEW. Like this Briscoe, uh, this Briscoe uh, trio, or I forgot what, what I'm gonna think. Trilogy, this Briscoe trilogy, to me, are the three best matches FTR has ever had. And they didn't happen to come with the company they were technically signed with. Well, look, that was going to be my first question when we're talking about the legacy. So let's get into it. Like, this rivalry is an incredibly rarefied air. All the matches were given five-star by Dave Meltzer. They're all over nine ratings and cage match, two of them over 9.5, which is just, like, so high. Uh, Like, is this FTRs? I don't know enough about the – like, cards on the table i said at the start like this was the the prism through which i became a fan and and enjoyed the briscoes for the first time um but like is is this ftr's best is this ftr's best ever match like out of everything they've done as the revival um you know against the young bucks against other other people as well like you know they had a great a great uh tag team match against uh john moxley and sam punk earlier in the in 2022 as well uh is this the best match that they've ever had yes this i mean it's yep. the best pure tag team match they've ever had yeah and like i say i i think they've done some other stuff i mean to me if you're thinking about their best matches it's them uh this uh their stuff with dimi America Alpha also in Dallas. FTR is like amazing in Dallas. Uh, you know, <laughs> so uh, you know they had to de- uh, all uh, yeah with Al- American Alpha or whatever in Dallas, and it was just like this was right up there. I think this was better than anything they ever done, and that's this is coming from one of their biggest fans saying this is one. You know, this is it's not like if you say the DIY match won't i won't argue with you if yep. you say american alpha i won't argue with you but my personal this was one this was yep. the the best tag match i've ever seen live and probably the best tag match i've ever seen on tape they would probably tell you it's not the best tag match they, they will say some midnight express versus um uh, a Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express on random TV in 1984 because they're they're nerds, which is they're tag team nerds, which is another reason I love them so much. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, this match this match is up there. It's like I it's a match I could watch anytime when you ask me to watch it, and I'm just like, okay, mm-hmm. that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. Well, because it's so pure. It's such a great match. For me, the ones that it comes up against, and you've, met, you've already mentioned most of them, there's American Alpha in Dallas versus DIY in Toronto, the two out of three falls match. Uh, there's this. There's the dog collar match that happened later on in the year. I also think the match they had with the Young Bucks at the Forum, literally the Wednesday after this one, <laughs> was was I think that's their best match with the Young Bucks personally. And then also, of course, you've got the two out of three falls match that they had on Collision in 2023 against um, Jay White and Juice Robinson. Yeah. And that um, just that just kind of came out of nowhere, if you think about yeah. it. Yeah. Like, like, because, like, the Jay White and Juice Robinson goes out to the, they only can have great tag team matches with other great tag teams. That just craps right on top of that, right? Because Jay White and Juice Robinson were, what, maybe five, ten matches together? At all, yeah. no one was. No one's talking about Jay White and Juice Robinson as their greatest tag teams of all time. And they yeah. went out there and put on this fucking classic, like uh, Meltzer says, the greatest TV, TV tag team match of all time, the greatest American TV tag team match of all time with a non-established tag team. So that one, the one thing was, is they had to be carried. That was the big thing. With it, it's like, well, yeah, they, of course you're going to have great matches with American Alpha, DIY, and other. Level. But you always ask, what was DIY's other great match? What was American Alpha's other great match? <laughs> well, yeah. You know, so sometimes their only great match was with FTR. Let's look at the common denominator. Yeah, I um, I really like the Young Bucks versus Eddie Kingston and John Moxley match. And I'd love to see FTR versus those two. That would be so good. Dude, um, FTR versus Mox and, 
Claudio early this year was yeah, fucking true. crazy. And yeah. I truly thought it was going to be like the first match of a new trilogy. And then yeah. Mox did his New Japan thing. So they yeah. haven't. I hope it comes back. Because I just thought that was incredibly hard hitting. Of course, FTR losing to North Carolina is not my favorite thing ever, but I was okay with who they lost to because it's fucking John Moxley and Claudio, two men that literally look like they could kill you any day of the week. So I was okay with yeah. that. Uh, before we get on to to the Briscoes, let's let's wrap things up for FTR. Watching this made me remember how good they were as heels. I feel like right now they're at a point where they could use a fresh coat of paint. They could do something. It could be nice to see them do something different. I don't know how they would feel about it because I feel like Dax Hall, Dax and Cash have really like found a groove as faces um, and, and sort of found their way on dynamite in a way they hadn't previously when they were trying to work as heels um, by working as faces. But Man, this made me want to see them as heels again. Uh, you, like you actually, you actually know Dax Harwood a little bit. I wouldn't say like you're friends with him or anything, but more than like more than any most wrestling fans know the wrestlers that they're fans of. You do. You have got to know Dax Harwood, shared drinks with him and stuff like that a fair bit. So I, I don't know if you've got any insight to that, but I'd love to see them as heels again. Okay, this reminded I- me how good they were. I've never asked them personally or whatever, but I just like the energy. You can tell they like being liked. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, and and I do, you know, I don't think Cash cares. I truly, and that's just like, again, this is all opinion based, based on my limited interactions with them. I don't think Cash cares. I think Dax might prefer being a face, but I think Dax, if it drives the story, he doesn't care what side he's on. If yep. you can tell, if you give him a good story and say this is going to be an amazing story, you know, but I need you to be this, he would do it. You know what I mean? So I, yep. I, that's that's again opinion based. I am this is just my opinion based on it. I'm like I'm not saying anything that they've ever said because I don't know, but uh, I think they would. Uh, but I my whole thing is I feel like there's a happy medium. Like they just got quote unquote put out by the young bucks, right? Now, if they come yep. back and do some heelish type shit to get even with the Young Bucks, I think you can, like, the whole thing is, when their faces, when FTR's face, they 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 really deal into being the best baby faces that they can have. But the thing with, like, Swerve and Moxley and people like that that are effective on these other levels is that they can still do dirty shit and be a good guy, Right. So yeah. I think they can bring a little bit of that old FTR, that Pitbull FTR, that limb work, whatever. But yeah, so if someone, uh, uh, you look at it, the Young Bucks took them out. They come back, they wrap the Young Bucks' legs and, you know, step on it and take a Young Buck out. No one's going to be like, oh, you sons of bitches. They're going to be like, oh, okay, if the Young Bucks deserved it. So I think there's a happy medium. I mean, I mean, I think there's a happy medium, but again, I 100% prefer, uh, prefer them as heels because I like limb work. I'm the weirdo that likes, I'm a limb pervert. I want you to work on a knee or an arm the whole match until the person can't take it anymore. So, See, it's not the limb work that, that I'm, I'm, I miss. It's like it was the arrogance. Yeah. The, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. The, um, it, it was a lot because they talked yeah. a lot of shit. When like they were, the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The superiority, like yeah. it, it's very much like a, you know, like we respect people now, whereas they didn't respect the Briscoes at first. And I thought it made, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, they need to have a tag. The the issue is like the real issue is they need to have a tag team to come up against. And there's like, let's face it, there's not that many great face tag teams in AEW at the moment. Um, yeah. unfortunately, like it's it's just not there. Um, you know, like the Young Bucks. They're well and truly heels, and you know who are, who are the faces going to be that they go against? Like you know, we yeah. we did the tag we did the tag team tournament earlier this year, and you know we kind of came up with like it's just it has to be these two teams because like There's they're no the two main else. teams. There's, there yeah. isn't there isn't really anyone else at the moment who's knocking down the door. Like 
maybe in in 2022 like the the issue was part part of the issue with the acclaimed and ftr was that they were both faces so they didn't and they didn't want to mess up that dynamic by having you know making it so that one of those teams had to get booed and and potentially ruin their cert both of them were like burgeoning their burgeoning popularity it was not the right time for them to face each other and and unfortunately the claimed aren't really <laughs> aren't really like super over right now either so the dude, like, the, the dude. it's hard to tell the claimed could definitely like you want to talk about the top two teams that could use a heel turn <laughs> the claimed in ftr <laughs> like yeah. it's like they both like people want to boo Max right now. I, I'm not gonna try to. I'm not gonna go off on a tangent. But people mm-hmm. want to boo the claim right now, and yeah. they, they should just give them a reason. Um, but you know, like I said, Kings of the Black Throne. I think there is a great series of matches between FTR and the Kings of the Black Throne. Uh, that's Malachi and Brody King. For people that might not know, yeah. I just think there's a. I think there's a great set of matches there. Uh, I, 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 I love their series with Daniel Garcia earlier this year. I thought that was very good. Yeah. When private parties ready and top flights ready. Infantry I think, baby. Uh, we both they, love they, the infantry. We do. <laughs> but I think there's a magical match with top flight. I think, I think they need, they need FTR to be flat out heels though. That's the only way it's going to work. Cause I, you know, top, top flight is that pretty much the opposite of what FTR is. Like, I don't consider the Young Bucks the opposite of FTR. You say they're like saying things side of a different coin or whatever, but Top Flight is completely opposite of FTR. And, you know, matchups make matches. So I'm like, I could go through the list because I right now the, uh, the tag team division on the AEW is on the back burner. I'm not saying it's down. I'm just saying they're focusing on other things right now. Mm. So... And and that's where I've decided to go with it, so I won't be bitter. Um, but yeah, it's just you know, it's it's like they're focusing on the women's division, they're focusing on all these other things. So literally, you got what five hours of TV, six hours of TV a week. You can't focus on everything. So I get with what's going on right now. But when mm. when they are ready to turn up again, uh, I think the teams are there. I just you you got to give them the time because yep. FTR works better. If you look at their history, they work better in feuds than they do in just like here's a match on Tuesday. They they can have a good <laughs> match on Tuesday. I think everyone, to... every every good every every good wrestlers like that. I think. But <laughs> I mean, there, no, there's this tag team called the Young Bucks. Literally, <laughs> you can just throw them on a match on Tuesday, and it's going to be magic. <laughs> I mean, DIY is the same way. I could go through my list of people that are just great match tag teams it doesn't matter who they're fighting uh if you just throw them on the match is going to be great not good great you know and at ftr they are better when there's a long story to tell with their uh, their matches and it's just like i know that does come off of second nature but in aew there are a lot of match guys there are a lot of guys that you could literally put in the match will osprey's one of them with anyone and it does not matter they're going to find a way to just like blow you out the water. I don't think FTR works like that. I think they can if they wanted to, but I think with the way they, they like the story tell, the way their match conclusions, it just comes better when it's, you know, like some heat behind it. You talked about my daughter and my wife. I've got to fuck you up kind of thing. And <laughs> that's where FTR thrives as opposed to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you because I'm better than you, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, let's move on from FTR. Let's talk about the Briscoes. And man, it's so I'm so mixed with my emotions because, like, I, in one in one way, it's I'm I'm so glad they got this. Um, like it's so sad that Jay Briscoe was struck down, and like it, it's a horrible situation that his family, his daughters, have to grow up without a father. Um, like. Mark's lost a brother. You know, they're very close in age. They ran a business together. Like, they are two peas in a pod. They wrestled together. The grief and and horrible stuff that that family has to go through, nothing can compare to it. Nothing can console them. But at the same time, I'm so glad that the Briscoes got this. They got this high-profile thing, which, like, They'd done high profile stuff in Ring of Honor before. And, and as I said, like I'm 
I, I was, but I, I did not watch Ring of Honor. And I know there's other people out there like like me where this was what they saw from the Briscoes. And this made me appreciate the greatness of this tag team. Even, and this is even before Jay Briscoe died, right? Like th- this made me appreciate this tag team in a way that I'd never done before because I'd just never dug into them before. I'd never like focused on them before as a, as a tag team. And, and this match was key to that. And then they had, you know, another incredible match. And then they had an even better match, which is possibly even better than this in the dog collar match. I'm so glad that they got to have this moment where the spotlight was well and truly on them Uh, in in the world of wrestling was focused on them and the matches that they were having and the greatness that they were that they were accomplishing in the ring. Uh, and, yeah, look, my hat's off to both of them. I, I just love everything they brought to this feud. I love their promos. Uh, they were such a great foil for that heel version of FTR we were talking about at the start. Like, they were such a great um, face tag team for them to come up against because they had that authenticity. They had that rawness. They had that toughness. Uh, and and they're able to bring the fire in the way that so many that very few other wrestlers and particularly tag teams were able to do and and presented themselves in such a unique and authentic uh, and true to themselves way uh, that connected and was and, and set up a beautiful story uh, and a great story and set up like such a fiery boiler boiler room atmosphere for this match to take place in. Uh, I just cannot say more good thing like I cannot say enough good things about. Um, them as a tag team uh, and like it's hard to to watch this and not be like touched by a bit of sadness at what happened but also happiness that it did happen at the same time it's and i need people to sell it it's the greatest trilogy of all time and that is the legacy one of the legacies of the riscos the greatest trilogy of all time and what i mean by this there was only three matches right there's only ever going to be three matches, unfortunately. So, like, any other trilogy you can think of, you're going to be like, well, this were their three best matches, right? But just think about it. These guys only wrestled officially three times and had three five-star matches. Never will have. Never will have. There's very few other, other, like, there's Omega Okada, Flair, Steamboat. Like, there's very yeah. few other... But you, and when you talk about those trilogies, rivalries at, at that level, yeah. yeah. But that was like the 400th time Flair and Steamboat had wrestled, right? True. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got those three, but you got, there was the 400th time they'd wrestled. Ric Flair said he'd wrestled Ricky Steamboat more than he'd wrestled anyone, right? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so you got that. And then Kenny Omega and, uh, uh, Kazushi Okada, they've wrestled more than three times, right? They had tag team matches. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. These are the only three times these tag teams are in the ring together. Yep. Only three times it'll ever happen. There'll be, unfortunately, because, I mean, I because, dude, because it happened really so shortly after the Don Carla match, I can't say. It was weeks after. Like, it was yeah, it was within yeah, weeks afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't say there's been a death in wrestling that's hit me harder than Jay Briscoe. So, for the life of me, and I'm in no way saying, I, you know, I I want him to be alive today. I want to see more Briscoe matches. But because it happened, and this is on it, there's only going to ever be three. And this is that makes it a perfect trilogy, right? And how many perfect, truly perfect trilogies are there? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, they're only happened three times. They all got the highest rating that you could basically get. No one has any notes on any of them. It was a perfect group of tag team wrestling that should be docu they it, like just like we're talking about there should be like when AEW does a documentary series it should be about those matches about how perfect that one year was for those two tag teams that found mm-hmm. perfect chemistry whether it was through the promos and the matches they found perfect chemistry it will literally never happen again both of these teams found each other when they needed each other. Like, Correct. as I said, the, the ring of honor was closing. It was going away. Uh, the Briscoes, like their future would have in wrestling would have been uncertain. Like they would have wrestled GCW and in Indies, but their future in the big spotlight was uncertain. And they found FTR and FTR, as we said, like FTR needed something. They, they needed 
something for their legacy. Like uh, this, this mat, like this series of matches for their legacy is so important. Uh, and these two teams found each other at the right time. And like, man, the way that they pay tribute to Jay Briscoe as well, like I'm talking about AEW in general and Tony Khan was so beautiful. I had to speak personally, like I had, there was a lot of death in my life in 2022. Um, and you can, if you want to know the details, I don't know why you would, but like I, I talked a bit about it in that, that piece I did when I stopped the podcast full gear and farewell. Uh, and like this at the end of the year, i bawled my eyes out when I watched that tribute video that they had and the way that Mark Briscoe spoke was so life affirming. Um, like I don't, I don't talk about this much on the podcast, but I'm a Christian man and to, to see someone going through trauma, the way that he was and and like his whole family. And yet he was able to speak of the, of the hope that he had because of his belief. It was so beautiful and it gave me hope in a way that like wrestling very, very seldom ever has like the way media and content that I watch very seldom ever, ever has. Uh, and like, I will, this match sets off the chain towards that. It sets off a chain of events that ends in, in that sort of thing happening. And, and like that adds another layer to this match, another layer of emotion, uh, and, and, thought and memory to this match that like there's just like there's no touching there's no touching it yes yes um yeah it's like you know one day just want to sit down with some wrestling nerds and just watch all three of these matches and geek out i mean there should be podcasts there should be podcasts like long firm like by ftr dax cash and mark briscoe just a podcast just talking about that year and where they were coming from in the promos and what was going on in their lives that you know that led to some of the type of things and I would I would eat it up because I do think this was perfection and I was at two of the three and it does bother yeah. me that I wasn't at the third but whatever <laughs> uh, but I was Mate, at two of the three yeah you've got you've got Dax's DM just hit him up tell him I'll do the interviews tell him I'll do that I'll put it together <laughs> dude so so uh, hey some people might say rightfully so. This is the one thing I can say. He said he's done with these until after he's retired. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if he, comes, if he comes on the match guide, I'm not going to have him. I'm not going to have him talking controversial topics. I'm not going to be asking him about the box. I'm not going to be trying to make uh, make headlines. I'm just going to be memorializing and and dig it into matches, mate. That's what I do here. That's what we do here. Um, we no, talk about the greatest matches. <laughs> I have I have pitched him doing the show, just not talking about current wrestling. I was like, man, keep <laughs> doing your show, just don't talk about current just wrestling. Talk about the Midnight yeah. Express. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just talk about old school wrestling. I'm like, you know, and you know, just don't talk about what's going on right now because uh, you know <laughs> that, that seemed to get people upset. But uh, no, uh, I can't wait. I mean, it's going to be open. I wish it was all four of them, all old and gray. At a star cast, sitting up on stage, just talking about how awesome it was that they found each other at this time in life. But we don't get that, unfortunately. Life doesn't always work out the way that we want it to. But, I mean, Jay left us 20 20 years of wrestling. But I can say he left us three perfect. He left us with three perfect matches. And, um, like I said, I only met him once. Super nice guy just down to earth you wouldn't eat like i will tell anybody uh, uh in a very short interaction i had with him i would say three to five minutes you wouldn't have known he was famous you wouldn't known he was a professional wrestler you wouldn't known that he was just on a pay-per-view he literally left the show walked across the street to a gas station to get his cigars he didn't send anyone else to do it <laughs> he did it and he was just standing out there smoking like just a regular like a regular dude and like and and again Listen to anyone that has that has known the person that has had anything to say about them. That is that is your legacy in life. You know what I mean? I always yep. said this. If I pass away or whatever, but like I was like, I don't need people to wax poetic about me. If if you can say, hey man, Floyd, that's a good dude. I lived a good life, and that's what I can say about Jay Briscoe from the friends and the family have talked about him. He was a good dude. I could not say more than that, Floyd. Uh, 
Let's leave it at that, Floyd. I think we have talked about this match and the Briscoes and FTR. Enough for tonight. But thank you so much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's let's talk about the dog collar match down the line. I'd love Dude, to do that one yes. as well. Yes. Um, We'll 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 put that we'll put that a pen in that we'll put a pen in this series we'll come back to it later uh, and talk about the other matches in this series because it is it is something special uh, and you know what we're going to keep talking about great matches here on the AW Match Guide podcast uh, in a fortnight's time I've got another one lined up that I think you'll be very excited to hear about Floyd I'm going to be talking about Eddie Kingston and CM Punk. Uh, in a fortnight's time. So Dude, very much was... looking forward to that. Yeah, great match. Great match. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, Floyd, do you want to tell the people where they can find you um, before we get out of here? All right. I do this little show called All Things Elite. We either do it. It comes out on Thursday or Friday. It just depends on the week. Uh, Austin's a very – Austin Sumowitz, my co-host, is a very visit man. And, of course, we're on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. You can follow us on Twitter at AT Elite Pod, or you can follow me directly at Floyd Johnson Jr. Uh, I am a very positive tweeter. So when stuff – like, if you see stuff bad happen or something and you never hear me say anything about it, that's – that's not that's not my vibe. That's not my social media vibe. I want to talk about the good things in life. So you will hear me talk about the good things in life. And today's good thing in life, July 15th, uh, 2024. I don't know if I should say the date, but that's the day we're recording this. <laughs> that's the day we're recording. <laughs> EA Sports, college football, comes back after a 10-year hiatus. So today at 3 o'clock, American Oklahoma time, I will be the happiest person on earth. This is grown man Christmas. Are you a Sunnah? I am not. I uh my brother uh, <laughs> uh that's my... the only thing I know about Oklahoma and college yeah. football. Yeah. I've got cards yeah. on the table yeah. for you. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, my brother is uh ten years older than me and he pretty much shaped everything I like in life. So my our his favorite team was Florida State growing up. So my favorite team since Pretty much the I knew what college football was has been the Florida State Seminoles. So, yeah, it's weird that I'm from Oklahoma and I root for Florida State. I know, but there's this thing called cable, so it really doesn't make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> all all good. Well, I, I don't know half of the words you just said, Floyd, but I trust that it's good and true. <laughs> yes. Um, you, as I said, you can listen to the AW Match Guide podcast here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network every fortnight. And in a fortnight's time, we're going to be talking about Eddie Kingston versus Sam Punk. But that's not all I do. Um, you can find my written work on awmatchguide.substack.com every off week. So once a fortnight, I do this podcast. Once a fortnight, I post a column on the AEW Match Guide Substack. That's awmatchguide.substack.com, uh, where I just talk about matches that I enjoyed. It's not all AEW matches, um, like I talked about Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins versus The Bar. Um, I've talked about Kota Ibushi versus Taichi, um, the match where they just kicked the shit out of each other, and that's all that. That's literally all they did for 15 minutes. It's a fantastic match. I'm um, just dropping match reviews on there as well, um, so you can find me there. And if you want to talk about any of it, um, you can find me on Twitter at Sir underscore Samuel, or as I said at the start, you can join the Social Suplex Discord um, where you can chat to not just myself, but hosts of all of our shows uh, and other listeners about wrestling, sport, pop culture, and much more. And we've got a lot going on at the Social Suplex, um, so make sure you keep abreast of it all. I think there's going to be some merch dropping soon as well. There's all sorts of stuff going on um, that you will be able to keep abreast of if you are on that Discord there. And, of course, there's all the other podcasts on the network, One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Tunnel Talk, the Trish and Sarah Wrestling Podcast, Wrestle Art with Chris Things, and Imps WWE Adventure, as well as the Match Guide, of course. Of course. you can't, I can't forget myself there. <laughs> um, but, Floyd, thank you so much for joining me. And to those of you who are listening today, thank you for listening. It is a joy to be back. I'm having so much fun digging into these matches and I cannot wait to do it all again with you in a fortnight's time. But until then, I'll say catch you Thanks for listening to the AEW Match Guide podcast. If you enjoyed the show, then you can subscribe on the podcast app of your choice so you never miss an episode. 
Also, feel free to let me know on Twitter at Sir underscore Samuel. I'd love to hear from you. The AEW Match Guide Podcast is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network, where you can find many other fantastic podcasts discussing not just AEW, but all parts of the world of professional wrestling. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. I'm Sam Brown.